The tornado story really began in 1967, when the air forces of Germany, Italy, Belgium and Holland began to investigate the feasibility of jointly producing an aircraft which could replace their accident-prone Lockheed Starfighters. Capable of carrying missiles and bombs, the high-speed Starfighter was used in a variety of roles, ranging from low-level attack and training to interception and reconnaissance. Since its replacement would have to fulfill all of these roles and meet the individual needs of each different country, the study was likely to be fraught with insurmountable problems. Within a year, Canada and Britain had both joined the group and the complexity of the task had increased even further. Although the general agreement was for a multi-purpose fighter bomber, each country specified a machine with a different performance level and a different weapons capability. Talks continued, but some of the differences remained unresolved, and within a year, Belgium and Canada had both pulled out of the consortium. In March 1969, the remaining four countries formed Panavia, a multinational company with the specific aim of managing the project. In July, Holland followed the example of Belgium and Canada and also withdrew, leaving Germany, Italy and Britain as the joint shareholders. Three major aviation companies each had a stake in Panavia. Germany's MBB and Britain's British Aerospace each had 42.5%, while Italy's Air Italia held the remaining 15%. If it succeeded, the project would have the potential for a large number of sales. So to reduce costs and increase efficiency, a second company was formed in order to deal with engine development. In September 1969, Turbo Union came into being. It was set up by the three national aero engine companies, Rolls-Royce of Britain, Fiat of Italy, and the German manufacturer MTU. By now, a detailed specification had been mutually agreed, and the new aircraft was designated as the MRCA, or Multi-Role Combat Aircraft. Based at its new headquarters in Bristol, Turbo Union began development work on the RB199, a small yet powerful engine designed by Rolls-Royce. As for the airframe, the planners had decided at an early stage that the MRCA should be built in both single-seat and twin-seat versions. The four main customers would be the Royal Air Force, the Italian Air Force, the Luftwaffe, and the German naval air arm, the Marineflieger. Although there was some overlap in the requirements of these services, the MRCA would have to perform a number of roles with equal competence. The RAF were looking for a two-seat all-weather attack aircraft capable of low-level attacks on airfields, tanks, troop concentrations and armored vehicles. The Luftwaffe and Aeronautica Militare Italiano were both looking for a single-seat, multi-role fighter, while the Marineflieger wanted an anti-ship aircraft. Panavia decided to use a variable geometry wing. This would mean that the aircraft would be kept relatively small and still be capable of good performance at high or low speeds and altitudes. Combined with two RB199s, the swing wing layout would ensure that the standard MRCA could be adapted to provide each country with precisely the aircraft it was looking for. The RAF requirement for an all-weather capability meant that the new machine would need to carry a number of sophisticated avionics systems. This in turn dictated the need for a two-man crew, one man to fly the aircraft and a second to operate its electronic equipment. After rearranging their existing crewing procedures, the German and Italian air forces opted for the two-seat version in place of their original single-seat preference. Plans for a single-seat MRCA were abandoned at the start of 1970, leaving the two-seater version as the only one to be developed. By the end of the year, there was a potential sales list for almost 900 aircraft. Of these, roughly 400 were destined for the RAF, 300 for the German Air Force, and 100 each for the German naval air arm and the Italian Air Force. While Panavia were working on the prototype and Turbo Union were testing the RB199, other major companies were brought in to supply the avionics systems. Texas Instruments were contracted to supply the radar and Ferranti, the MRCA's inertial navigation system. In spite of persistent opposition from both the politicians and press, 
the prototype was nearing completion by the end of 1973. After final assembly at MBB's Ottobrunn factory, it began engine runs in early 1974. By the summer, it was ready to fly, and on the afternoon of August 14th, it took off from the nearby airfield at Munich. The maiden flight lasted a little over 30 minutes and revealed no serious design flaws in either the airframe or the engines. It was crewed by Niels Maisto of MBB and flown by Paul Millett of BAC. Paul Millett takes up the story. After starting the engines, which was an absolutely normal start, we went through the checks of all the systems, everything you will need in flight, the aircraft controls, flaps, trims, hydraulic systems, everything is working. And I'm glad to say it all worked perfectly. We taxied onto the runway, backtrack a short distance, and then turned the aircraft around and lined up on the runway. Checked the aircraft were airborne. So, releasing the brakes, and the aircraft accelerated very nicely indeed down the runway. By the time we'd passed 120 knots, it was speeding even then as though it wanted to lift in the air, but this, this was a much lower speed than I was intending for the first time to get airborne. So I made certain that we stayed on until something like 160 knots, and lifting off there, it flew as though this was the environment that we'd been built for. Leaving the undercarriage and flaps down, so as not to change anything initially, I climbed up to 10,000 feet where the engines were throttled back and we settled down at a steady 200 knots. The aircraft with undercarriage and flaps up was handling even better than I've described already and I checked the handling at various speeds. So we accelerated slowly in stages up to 300 knots, checking the handling as we went and the handling throughout was absolutely perfect. It could, couldn't have been improved upon. We descended back to the airfield and flew past at 300. Turning back downwind, slowed the aircraft down and selected back to the configuration for the approach. Flaps down and undercarriage down, all of which went down exactly as planned. And the handling at low level on the approach confirmed exactly what we'd found during the low speed handling at high altitude, that the aircraft is absolutely stable in, in the approach configuration on the final approach for landing. It feels as though it's on rails and you could sit with hands and feet off and let the aircraft fly itself down for landing. So I made one approach, checking that all looked well and an overshoot and then being completely confident that the aircraft uh, would give no problems Slightly slower speed for the final landing, but even so, the handling was still absolutely perfect, stable, rock steady, giving me no problems whatever. It really felt uh, like an aircraft that had been flying for many years, um, and from the time of leaving the ground, the aircraft uh, was one of the nicest I'd ever flown. And for a first flight, this is really something tremendous. All in all, an absolutely perfect first flight. On the 30th October, the first British assembled prototype made its maiden flight at Wharton. By 1976, seven more machines had flown, bringing the total number of airworthy prototypes to nine. In the same year, the MRCA was officially renamed Tornado, and by the end of the decade, another 16 aircraft had joined the test program. When it was finally ready to enter service in July 1980, the Tornado project had taken more than 13 years to reach fruition. With nearly 5,000 hours of test flying, it represented one of the longest development programs ever undertaken for a military aircraft. Since the MRCA had been a multinational project, 
all three countries had chosen to convert their air crews using a combined special training school. Two machines were delivered to the Tri-National Tornado Training Establishment based in England at RAF Cottesmore. The first group of instructors were themselves trained by the expert test pilots from Panavia. Using a completely new approach to aircrew training, the personnel that followed from each country would combine to form pilot and navigator teams regardless of their individual nationalities. As well as being the most effective method of converting crews to the tornado, the TTTE also introduced a high degree of cooperation amongst the European Air Forces of NATO. The merits of actually having a tri-national training are probably twofold. One, obviously, is the uh, social side, which is a vast improvement because one gets the best of every world. One gets German beer, Italian wine, and a fairly good mix of uh, social strata. On the professional side as well, uh, I think originally a lot of people were probably wary of whether it would work or not, but in fact it's been proved to work very, very well. And indeed, when uh, crews come here, we deliberately try and put uh, a mixture of crews together. So if we have got, say, British pilot and British navigator going through, we will not crew them together, but we will in fact make sure that they are crewed with different nationalities. That again has uh, benefit because sometimes if the, if the British are uh, used to flying in, the, in our low-level system, they can then help the other chaps who probably haven't flown over in this country before. And one gets the benefit all the way through. Uh, once it gets to the squadron, you also have the benefit, of course, that you have actually had a look at different tactics and the way other people operate, and you can appreciate the differences that uh, people are going to have in the future. As the school gradually expanded, aircraft were sent by each country to form a full training complement of 50 machines. Having learnt to fly the aircraft, RAF crews would undergo combat training at the Tornado Weapons Conversion Unit based at Honington. Formed in June 1981, it began to take delivery of its first machines in August of the same year. Five months later, on January 6, 1982, Number 9 Squadron became the first operational unit in any of the three countries to receive the Tornado. In RAF service, the Interdictor Strike Version, or IDS, was designated as the Tornado GR1. Although Britain had already planned for a long-range interceptor version, it would be almost three more years before the ADV, or Air Defence Variant, was ready to enter service. As IDS production increased, Germany's Marina Flieger began to take its first deliveries in July 1982. In October, 617, the famous Dam Buster Squadron, had become the second GR1 unit to be fully operational with RAF Strike Command. By August 1983, the tornado had reached units of the Luftwaffe and the Italian Air Force, and the first of six squadrons serving with the RAF in Germany had begun to re-equip with the GR1 version. A high payload and superb low-level performance make the GR1 an ideal attack aircraft for long-range operations in the European theater. Two RV-199 engines, each rated at 16,900 horsepower, give it a maximum speed at 36,000 feet of Mach 2.2. Top speed at sea level is Mach 1.2, and the advanced avionics systems enable the pilot to remain supersonic while flying at a height of between 1 and 200 feet. Fully laden, the aircraft has a maximum weight limit of 60,000 pounds, allowing it to carry a war load of more than 18,000 pounds. With a full weapons load, the GR1 has an operational radius of almost 900 miles. Internal armament consists of two high-velocity 27mm Mauser cannon mounted low down, one either side of the nose wheel. A vast array of weapons, stores and electronics countermeasures equipment can be carried under the fuselage and on the four wing pylons. Since each pylon is designed to swivel, the weapon it carries remains pointing fore and aft, regardless of the angle of sweep being used on the wings. Although the three European air forces using the Tornado each have their own preferred weapons configuration, the RAF, AMI and the Luftwaffe 
all rely on the Sidewinder as the aircraft's standard defensive missile. The offensive armament of RAF tornadoes can vary considerably, from conventional bombs to nuclear weapons. The aircraft is capable of carrying either a single 500 kiloton nuclear bomb, eight 1,000 pound conventional bombs, or the Paveway laser-guided smart bomb. Controlled by the LRMTS target acquisition system mounted in the nose of the tornado, the Paveway can be launched by one aircraft and guided by another. Used against static targets such as bridges, aircraft bunkers, command shelters or oil installations, it can be delivered with pinpoint accuracy. The laser guided bomb is uh, percentage wise I would say roughly probably 80% efficient. It works because what you do need is another aircraft to actually point an active laser at the target. At the front of the bomb, which is still the dumb bomb, there is a laser seeker head. Uh, once the bomb is released, the seeker head will then uh, pick up the reflected laser energy off the target and will then, using uh, gas motors, will then fly down the reflected laser energy and hit the target. This means that with probably one bomb, you've got an 80% chance of hitting the target. And in fact, one laser-guided bomb can do more damage now than a whole salvo of uh, unguided dumb bombs used to do before. So in fact, you end up, end up with far better probability of kill for one aircraft with two bombs than probably you did with six or seven aircraft dropping dumb bombs in salvos. Two recent additions to the Tornado's armory are the Alarm missile system for use against anti-aircraft radars and the JP-233 cluster bomb for use against enemy airfields. Two giant containers mounted underneath the fuselage can be loaded with nearly 250 individual explosive devices. These would be a mixture of SG-357 runway cratering bombs and HB-876 mines which descend by parachute and are designed specifically to damage runways and prevent repairs. Another cluster weapon is the BL-755, containing almost 150 high-velocity anti-tank bomblets. The German Air Force are also equipped with the BL-755, but have their own weapons dispenser, the MW-1, for use against airfields. Once again, the large flat section underneath the fuselage makes an ideal mounting point for such a large weapon. When fully loaded, the 15-foot container can weigh up to five tons and launch a devastating quantity of munitions over a large or small area. Several thousand devices can be carried simultaneously. These can range from mines and armor-piercing bomblets for use against tanks and other armored vehicles to fragmentation bomblets for use against enemy troops. The Luftwaffe's more ordinary weapons consist of high-explosive 250-pound, 500-pound and 1,000-pound bombs. In their anti-shipping role, the tornadoes of the German naval air arm are equipped with a range of conventional bombs varying in size from 250 pounds to 1,000 pounds. But their primary weapon system is the air-launched Cormoran anti-ship missile. Carried in pairs, the missiles have a range of 20 miles and can fly just above the surface of the sea at a speed of approximately 600 miles an hour. Target information is initially provided by the aircraft's computer, but once launched, the onboard navigation and radar systems enable the cormorant to find and hit its target unaided and with a high degree of accuracy. 
As well as being the standard equipment of the Marina Flieger, the Cormoran is also used by the Italian Air Force, whose tornadoes perform a wide variety of roles, ranging from anti-shipping to ground attack. Their other weapons include the German MW-1 dispenser and the BL-755 cluster bomb. Since it entered service with the RAF in 1982, the Tornado has repeatedly proved its effectiveness by taking part in a number of international competitions. The first of these occurred in 1984, when a group of aircraft from 617 Squadron entered the celebrated bombing contest hosted by the US Air Force Strategic Air Command. The dozens of teams taking part represented air forces all over the world. Equipped with some of the most advanced aircraft ever built, they represented the elite bombing crews from each service. The RAF tornadoes achieved near perfect scores to take first and second place in the individual aircraft event, second place in the pairs event, and first and third in a competition against the USA's F-111s. To try and compare the Tornado to other aircraft sometimes is, uh, it seems, easier than it actually is. In comparison to the F-111, the Tornado is a later aircraft, and in fact the nearest comparison to the F-111 would have been the TSR-2, had we got it, which are both basically same generation aircraft. I know the Tornado looks like the F-111, but the Tornado was actually designed to be slightly less range. The F-111 is a long range strategic bomber. And the early F-111 had very, very basic navigation kit in it. The later upgrades in the F-111 navigation suite gave it very similar capabilities to the Tornado. However, the F-111 is a much larger aircraft and was always designed to have a much longer range, as I say, comparable with that of the uh, TSR-2, or indeed the Vulcan at the time. With two outstanding performances in its first two competitions, the aircraft had gained a formidable reputation on a worldwide scale. In the following years, the RAF's tornadoes have taken part in operational exercises on a routine basis. These include complex and intensive combat exercises, such as the FLAG series, held in America and aimed at increasing the wartime effectiveness of a multinational air force. Green FLAG and Red FLAG have been staged by the US Air Force for the last 20 years. I've participated in one red flag, and it was indeed one of the earlier ones for the Tornado Force. It was in 1986 when I was serving in Germany. At the time, the biggest advantage of red flag was it was the closest you could actually get to a real war with Warsaw Pact, of course, in existence then, without actually doing the real thing, which is considerably damage one's health. Uh, the idea of red flag was they, actually, they simulated and indeed, indeed did use real Soviet kit so you actually had a threat scenario which was normally in a good weather situated area such as Nevada and the idea was you had a, a threat scenario you went into the large American sort of package type uh, policy and ran through a threat area with that you also had a lot of uh, support aircraft you had your own fighter escorts to go with you and you also had aggressor aircraft i.e. American aircraft playing at Russians with Russian tactics to come and try and shoot you down as well. So the big advantage of it was it was the nearest thing you could actually get to your, what your job would be for real without actually being shot at. The squadron is frequently involved in exercises here in West Germany. In conjunction with the Army Ground Liaison Officer, sorties are planned to test and develop the different skills of pilot and navigator and assess reaction time to various tasks. November Delta 449814. That's going to be about the south end of Area 5 here. So A typical low level sortie begins with the planning phase. For Tornado, this is accomplished on the cassette preparation ground station. On the electronic map table, the navigator enters route information into the computer using a map cursor. Planned ground speeds, fuel load, and fuel flow are then typed in. The system quickly produces a fully detailed route plan. This flight data is transferred to a programmed cassette for use in the aircraft. During the pre-flight checks, the navigator loads the flight plan into the aircraft's main computer by running the cassette in the cockpit voice recorder. 
Flight data is displayed on either of the two TV displays in the rear cockpit. This is the mission plan format, with a labelled diagram of the route showing waypoints, fixed points and targets. The actual system was designed to take you at low level in bad weather or at night. And indeed, most of the times the aircraft has now been used offensively has been low level at night. Uh, the whole nav attack system is designed to be able to keep you 200 feet above uh, any high ground or obstacle with no visual references whatsoever. To do that, it does have the terrain following radar, which feeds via the autopilot and once it's uh, in automatic mode, will keep the aircraft above any high ground or obstacles that are in the front. The navigation system itself, again, is computerized, and a main computer actually runs the system. However, main computers still need manual input. Uh, the main computer is fed from an inertial navigation system, very similar to airliners have, and from a mapping radar. The mapping radar is run by the navigator. The navigator uses the mapping radar to upgrade the uh, kit from fixes that you find on the ground. You find a pre-planned fix, see what the error is, feed that error into the aircraft. Normally, that is accurate. Unfortunately, it's like any computer, garbage in means garbage out. So it's up to the navigator to uh, assess how accurate the fix is, monitor the system. Because if he makes a mistake on the assessment or the monitoring, the kit will then go out to lunch. Fly-by-wire allows the adoption of a sophisticated command and stability augmentation system, or CSAS for short. It gives a standard of handling which is unique in high-performance combat aircraft. At the heart of the CSAS are two computers, one for pitch and one for roll and yaw. Pilot demands made by the control column and rudder pedals are fed into the appropriate computers and combined with signals from pitch roll and your rate gyros to give the appropriate demands for control service deflection. Rudder movements are transmitted via the your computer. Symmetrical tailplane demands come via the pitch computer. Differential demands come via the roll and pitch computers. At forward sweep angles, roll demands are also fed to the spoilers. The computers also receive signals of flap and air brake position for pitching moment compensation. If multiple faults occur in the CSAS computers, the system will revert to direct electrical links to the hydraulic jacks. If a fault develops or battle damage is sustained to the electrical links, a mechanical backup linkage will continue to operate the tailorons to provide a get-you-home control. Thanks to CSAS, handling characteristics and stick forces are remarkably consistent throughout the range of angles of wing sweep. With the aircraft clean, or with a heavy store load. The CSAS damps out the effect of gust and, combined with a high wing loading, gives a uniquely smooth ride at speeds and heights which minimize exposure to radar and ground fire. The main role of the tornado is to fly low level. 
And indeed, quite often at low level, especially when you're flying over hilly or lumpy terrain, the turbulence can be quite severe. With the fly-by-wire system, again, you actually see the control surfaces moving when you're flying at low level, but there's no inputs going in. And the main advantage of the fly-by-wire system is that it will try and smooth out all the turbulence that you would otherwise expect. Indeed, I've flown other aircraft where you're rattling around like a dry pea in a cocoa tin at uh, low level, whereas the Tornado, if we had a facility for a cup of coffee, you can virtually put a cup of coffee down and it will be quite smooth, even though the outside turbulence is uh, quite severe. So it does give you, at the crew, a uh, smooth ride, which is less fatigue orientated and also lets you do the job. I've flown low level again in other aircraft where it's been impossible even to read the instruments at low level because you've been shaking so much. The spirit of collaboration to which you, Sir Austin, have referred has been in evidence in both the industrial and governmental levels of our partners, Germany and Italy. And this should not be overlooked when we take justifiable pride in the features which make the F-2 unique. It's powerful air intercept radar linked to conformally mounted missiles and a sophisticated advanced control system which frees the pilot from many of the problems of flying an advanced combat aircraft. So in thanking you all, let me repeat the great pleasure I feel and the great pride I feel in coming here to unveil the first two of the Tornado F2s. And I have great pleasure now in formally conducting the opening ceremony. By late 1984, the F-2 air defense variant of the Tornado was finally ready to enter service with the RAF. First deliveries went to 229 Operational Conversion Unit, based at Coningsby in Lincolnshire. Since it was designed to operate in a very different role to the IDS version, the air defense Tornado incorporated several major changes. As a long-range interceptor, it is fitted with the Marconi Fox Hunter air interception radar, in place of the Ferranti terrain following system. Used in combination with the Skyflash air-to-air -air missile, the Marconi system has a look-down, shoot-down capability that can counter an airborne threat from up to 25 miles away. While an extended nose section provides enough space to house the radar, extra fuel tanks enable the F-2 to carry more fuel than the IDS version. This gives it an endurance of well over two hours and the ability to fly combat air patrols when up to 400 miles away from base. Endurance can be extended dramatically if the aircraft uses drop tanks or in-flight refueling. With one less cannon than the IDS version, there is enough room for the in-flight refueling probe to fully retract into a housing on the port side of the fuselage. Powered by the same Mark 103 engines as the IDS variant, the F-2 is intended only as a stopgap until the arrival of the more powerful F-3. In April 1987, number 29 squadron based at Coningsby became the first unit to receive the F-3. Improvements over the F-2 version included extra launches for carrying four sidewinders instead of two and the addition of automatic controls for the swing wings. For slow speed flight, the wings are set at a low angle to increase surface area and provide greater lift. As speed increases, the wings pivot backwards into a slot in the fuselage. The fully swept position with an angle of just under 70 degrees is used in high speed flight where less lift is needed. By moving a lever inside the cockpit, the pilot can still control the angle of sweep manually. Using extended tailpipes to boost the afterburner thrust, the F3's two uprated Mark 104 engines give an increased power output of almost 19,000 pounds. When fully loaded, the F-3 weighs considerably less than its IDS cousin, and with better thrust at all altitudes, it can accelerate quicker and fly faster. Maximum speed at low altitude is over 900 miles per hour. At high altitude, it is almost 1,500 miles per hour. As production of the ADV variants got underway at the Wharton factory, the F-2 and F-3s gradually replaced the RAF's Lightnings and Phantoms. By 1991, 
six more strike command squadrons had received the F-3. The air defense of Great Britain is now the responsibility of Number 11 Group, whose headquarters are based at Bentley Priory in Middlesex. Having taken over the role of primary interceptor from the group's McDonnell Douglas Phantoms, the F-3 Tornado is likely to remain in service until well into the next century. As well as operating with the air forces of Britain, Germany and Italy, the Tornado is now in service with two other countries. In 1985, the governments of Saudi Arabia and Oman announced orders for a combined total of 80 aircraft. While 32 of these were for the air defense variant, the remainder were for the interdictor strike version. When Iraq invaded Kuwait in August 1990, Saudi Arabia's tornadoes joined those of the RAF to form part of the coalition air force spearheaded by America. The British involvement in the early stages was dominated by the RAF. Under the code name of Operation Granby, squadrons of F-3 and GR-1 tornadoes, together with Seepcat Jaguars, flew to bases in Saudi Arabia and Bahrain. The first group of tornadoes was ready for action within 24 hours of arriving. By the time the coalition's build-up of forces was complete, a quarter of a million men, 12,000 armored fighting vehicles, and nearly 3,000 fixed-wing aircraft had been deployed to the area. In terms of both quality and quantity, their combined air strength was vastly superior to the Iraqi Air Force. Before long, tactical air power would prove to be the decisive factor. The coalition's plan for an air offensive was made up of four distinct phases. The first two involved the destruction of the Iraqi air defense system and the bombing of key strategic targets such as roads, bridges and communication centers. Phase three called for the destruction of the Iraqi army's ability to fight. And phase four would provide air support for coalition ground forces as they moved into Kuwait. When the offensive started on January 16th, the tornado's first task was to attack Iraqi airfields using the JP-233 runway cratering bomb. Carried out at night, these low-level missions were of vital importance, but proved to be exceptionally dangerous. The tornadoes encountered heavy opposition from both anti-aircraft guns and SAM missiles. One aircraft was shot down on the very first day, and by the end of the week, four more had been lost in action. When uh, the airplane was employed in the low flying, it was tasked uh, against heavy defended targets, mainly airfields or heavily defended deposits. And uh, <clears throat> that caused, of course, quite a high attrition rate in comparison with the other airplane employed in the conflict. But uh, still, the attrition rate uh, suffered in that environment uh, is, can be considered quite good, even if it's quite sore to think of the guy has been shot down, of course. If you uh, want to make uh, the comparison against uh, a like to be Soviet uh, uh, airfield heavily def heavy defended by both flax and uh, surface to air missiles, a short range uh, IR or, or radar guided. Uh, nevertheless, of course, it's not being an easy task. It has been task, of course, to go uh, to deploy like JP-233 for the British side. We have only been uh, deploying uh, retarded bombs at the time. And uh, that will expose the airplane to uh, quite heavy uh, defended um, uh, threat, basically. Going to high level uh, did reduce quite a bit the attrition rate, and even if the airplane was not designed to do this at all, and uh, it did suffer on the energy side in comparison with the uh, modern, uh, modern fighters like F-16 would be able to defend themselves much better in high level because the energy available to the, to the airplane would be higher. 
As the coalition declared air supremacy, the GR1s were withdrawn from their low-level attack role. For the rest of the war, they were usually operated at much higher altitudes. During February, most of the RAF's tornadoes were deployed in the air campaign against Iraqi bridges, road links and supply dumps. By the middle of the month, two-thirds of all the major bridges had been destroyed and the RAF had dropped more than 2,000 1,000-pound bombs. We were mainly tasked for um, target that will require the high impact angles and high speed and precision delivery as well. So basically, the war employee from my level, keeping the airplane away from the uh, flags at AAA as well, and uh, using uh, normally laser guided uh, <coughs> bombs to be able to hit uh, accurately the target. Some employment has been uh, done, especially for our side, for quite a bit with uh, unguided weapons, but then of course it, the um, target you, uh, you can go for, from my level, cannot be that uh, pinpoint. I mean, you can uh, expect a bomb dropping from anywhere between 10 and, and 20,000 feet of altitude to be more than 100 feet in accuracy. Uh, so basically, with uh, arrows between 100 and 200 feet, you have to go for big areas rather than for a pinpoint target. So it's not a thing you would hit a, a bridge. With the Iraqi Air Force either put out of action or unwilling to challenge for air supremacy, the ADV tornadoes had little opportunity to engage in air combat. Most of the missions flown by the F-3 variants were combat air patrols over Iraqi territory. The war lasted until the end of February. But once the coalition had gained air superiority, the outcome was almost a certainty. By the end of hostilities, a total of nine tornadoes had been lost.